Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel and the Active Towns podcast. My name is John Zimmerman and I am delighted to welcome into the podcast, Matt Pender. <laughs> Matt, welcome. Thanks, John. It's uh, it's great to be here. A little bit closer to in the flesh this time. I can yeah, see yes. your face. Yes, and I should say welcome back because you've been on the podcast before. <laughs> so that's good stuff. In fact, you were on the podcast back in season one. So it was season one, episode number 49, and uh, along with Justin Jones, and we were talking extensively about uh, feet struts, bicycle priority streets, and uh, I have a, a feeling that we that topic might come up again. <laughs> it's a great topic. To it, revisit. It's it's a great topic, and it's something that um, it, there's a big difference between what uh, the Dutch, you know, view as a bicycle priority street or a feet strut uh, type of street, the 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 way the Danes approach it, the way the Germans approach it, and then the way North America approaches it. <laughs> So, but why don't we do this just to kind of kick things off? Why don't you take just a moment to introduce uh, yourself to the audience? Okay, I am Matt Pinder. I wear many hats, but uh, professionally, I am a transportation engineer and I specialize in the design of complete streets and active transportation infrastructure. So, bike lanes, sidewalks, road safety, safe intersections. Uh, that's that's all under my realm. I've been doing that for several years now, and I'm working myself into this kind of specialist niche there. But uh, some of my other hats, I run the blog beyondtheautomobile.com, where I really talk about innovation and street design and imagining a more human-centered future of transportation. I'm active on Twitter, and I'm starting to get into the, the YouTube realm as well. I'm experimenting with making some videos, as as you know. And uh, my, my third hat is I do some community leadership and advocacy. And um, I've kind of taken on a new initiative recently to, to focus on a, a big box plaza that's across the street from my house and form a community group around how we can reimagine it as like a a redeveloped, very urban town center for our neighborhood. Uh, I'm sure there's other things I've forgotten about, but that's that's me in a nutshell. Well, I, f I found one thing that you, you may have forgotten about, and that was bike mines. Look at that. What's bike mines all about? Yeah, yeah. Great, great question. Uh, that's, that's more of the community advocate leadership hat. Um, I started Bike Minds after a trip to the Netherlands several years ago, back in 2018. And uh, it was really in response to realizing that Toronto, where I was living at the time, had this pretty cool cycling culture. Like, there was a lot of stuff happening around around bikes, but the uh, the public discourse was very negative. It was like about what could be improved, what was needed, about bikes getting stolen, very kind of negative leaning. And uh, I, I saw this as an opportunity to really celebrate the positives. Of course, there's work to be done, but uh, at the same time, there's amazing people doing amazing stuff that is related to bikes. And so I started the storytelling event at a bicycle-themed cafe, the absolute perfect venue. And um, we started with four monthly events, and they all sold out. We had a packed house. We had a wait list. And uh, people really appreciated this opportunity to kind of get outside their their normal day to day and see something or someone that's doing something absolutely out of this world on a bike, like uh, a family of nomads with two young children who travel the world and bike through deserts and tundra and uh, just about anything else together. Um, and, and then take it back to like the everyday person who bikes through the winter and just telling their story too. It was, it was a really cool way to think about the culture of cycling and really help understand that everybody's experience is very different. And with a little bit more empathy, we can all live happier and better lives. Yeah. And it looks like, uh, so the last events were in uh, 2021 uh, and you've, you've since moved, of course. And so now you're, you're no longer in the Toronto area. Was this in the 2021 uh, 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 timeframe? Was that still in Toronto? So I moved to Ottawa in 20. 19 no oh, okay. 2020 okay and i was very excited to bring bike minds to ottawa we had ah. our first event at a packed venue 120 people came and it was such a wild success yeah. and then a month later the global pandemic hit, hit. <laughs> so 
We took a break for a while, but then we yeah. pivoted to online meetings and uh, we, okay. we, we did Zoom for a while we, with pretty strong success. And it really opened up this realm of we could now have storytellers who live just about anywhere in the world onto our events. So we right. had a we had one that was themed around South America. We had some people from Europe, some people from Australia and really expanded our horizons there. And uh, I, I'm I'm at a point where we're taking a pause in it right now, so I can focus on some other priorities. One of which being I've started a family this year. I was just gonna <laughs> say, I, gee, I, I wonder, I I wonder what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> so but why don't I'm, you ad- why don't you address that a little bit in terms of just you know that that is a pretty major life change, and and you're just coming off of of, of parental leave too. Uh, talk a little bit about how and, and, and reflect a little bit about how um, impactful that event, that new life uh, reality is for you in terms of, of kind of reframing or, or really emphasizing uh, the type of work that you're doing. What changes have come up in, in your mind? Yeah, so uh, January this year, I, I became a father. I have a daughter uh, named Alia, who's now eight months old, and she's an absolute sweetheart. I just came back from a uh, summer of parental leave, spending lots of time with her and, and my wife and doing some traveling. But, you know, it, it really causes you to think differently. I, I think, like, one of the big things is how I see my future. And, um, you know, previously my future was very structured around, like, where will I be living? What will my job be? And that's, you know, that's two to five year horizon. Now my future is, well, 10 years from now, my daughter will be 10 and she will be doing school. And 20 years from now, she'll be 20 and an adult and going to university. And so it it really, like, it really um, changes the way you think about what's happening in the future and what's going to, what's, what's down the road. And, uh, we picked our neighborhood very much aligned to starting a family, but it's now I'm thinking about things like what's the commute to daycare like and how do we get to school and can we bike there and can we bike there all year round and uh, will I be able to structure my life around really teaching her the value of walking and cycling because it's obviously something that's very important to me. And then another thing that's really changed is you know, when you're traveling with someone who is so little and vulnerable you really think differently i when i when i cross a busy intersection next to my house i have to be so much more vigilant and careful and uh, i'm so much more sensitive to when someone runs a red light or turns too fast around a corner there's uh, she's not even walking yet that's going to be an entirely different round of stress i'm sure but uh, that that's something that's going to be shaping shaping me for years to come and then the third part is that I, I now get to share this like incredible joy in my life with someone else. And I am so excited for when she is old enough to come cycling with me. I'm already planning out what kind of bike I'm going to buy. I have in a box downstairs a front child bicycle seat that I'm ready to install. And uh, I'm just really getting ready for next year when we're going to bike just about everywhere and have uh, that wonderful shared experience together. Yeah, yeah, that is so, such good stuff. So you said something there that is is, is very very um, important, and I think that uh, it 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 kind of brings up this uh, this book that I just recently um, uh, listened to, and it was uh, "What We Owe the Future" by William McCaskill, and uh, really the concept is is really thinking long term. You know, <laughs> long term for some of us is is like, uh, you know, what are we going to be doing at the end of the month or, <laughs> you know, or, you know, two or three years down the line. But you just mentioned it, it kind of reframes because you're thinking, you know, it's it, it's not those short, shorter time horizons of, you know, three to four years, five years. I mean, now you're starting to look at, at you know, your children and then reframing and you start to think about well what about your grandchildren and then you start to and and really what uh, mccaskill was talking about is really thinking in terms of long term and and sort of sort of how uh many of the indigenous people native american uh many of them used to think in terms of seven generations you know what do you think about when you start thinking about what we're doing today that will have an impact on future generations you start to put things into that perspective and it's just like oh yeah okay 
what we're building, what we're doing, the, the, the important work that we're trying to accomplish here really could, could have profound, uh, you know, impact, you know, for the future. It seems like you're starting to feel a little bit of that too. Absolutely. Um, and I work in transportation planning where when, when we build a street, we build that street for 40 or 60 years. And when we build a bridge, we build that bridge for 60 or 80 years or even longer. And, um, to think about the future in those terms is, is very different. We, we, you know, we're, we're in, we, I feel like sometimes we're in the status quo state of transportation planning where we look at what we've done in the past and we just project that out to the future. But the future 60 years from now is going to be so different than today and from 60 years ago. And, um, Obviously, having a having a child has made me think more about the future. But I, I I was thinking a lot about the future well before then too, as a as a transportation planner who who looks at big studies that people have made that you know call for a four lane road to be widened to a six lane road, and that's how we're planning for the future. And is is that really the future that we need or want? Is, is a question <laughs> exactly. I, I really just want to shout from the top of a mountain sometimes. <laughs> Well, and let's let's address that too because you're in an industry where um, you know there's there's this mindset as an engineer that you know no this is the way we do things we follow these guidelines and these manuals and and this is how we do it and this is what we prioritize and so it is quite unusual for transportation engineers to uh, you know speak up and say you know hey no. <laughs> We have to think beyond the automobile. Talk a little bit about what inspired you to, you know, start this blog. I was originally inspired to start the blog because I, I had a fascination with the future of transportation. And initially it was really focused on technology as a means to to improve transportation, you know, self-driving vehicles and connected vehicles and uh, as I started to get more into the dialogue, I started to realize that there are big shortcomings with relying on technology to solve our transportation problems. You know, there's there's those great memes on the internet where if, if you replace all the gas cars with electric cars, you still get a highway that's full of cars. Nothing nothing has really changed. And with self-driving cars, wait, you wait, wait, w- what do you mean? I thought that was the solution. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is... This is the angst that I you know. and I have to deal with sometimes. <laughs> but, so, but do you do you get pushback from some of your brethren in in the engineering field when when they you know learn that you're you know doing all this kind of advocacy work that is maybe in conflict with you know the you know bowing down to the god of LOS? Good question. Um, I'm fortunate enough that I've I've worked myself into a niche where by the time a project gets to me, the client I'm working for has already decided they needed to make big changes to the street. So I, I'm not the director of transportation for a municipality who really has to fight for changes to how projects are prioritized. I'll I'll, I'll work on a project where the scope is to build a complete street on on X Street from A to B. There's obviously day to day trade-offs that have to happen there, like you provide a turn lane or a nice buffer with trees and such. Um, but yeah, the, the topic of how to be both an advocate and a professional is something I, I, I think about a lot and I've had a lot of experience with both. I'm, I, it's funny you mentioned that because I have a, a LinkedIn article that's drafted and just about ready to go on exactly this topic, I'm just waiting for the right time to, to publish it. But I, I've, learned, I've learned lots of lessons along the way of how to be the right kind of advocate. And um, especially when you're a professional, the, the tone of your arguments really can resonate or uh, the opposite with people. And you want to keep a level of respect with your peers and and you don't want to be seen as as insulting or or lowering your peers as well so what i've really learned is that uh i should uh, i always lead positively when i advocate or i i do my best to lead positively in in as many situations as possible so rather than picking something and criticizing it i'll find something positive in it and then maybe uh, a couple constructive questions or or compelling questions afterwards rather than, um, you know, throwing a certain discipline or a type of engineer or a 
or a project under the bus. I, I, I always try to, to pick the, the best examples and share them to show that we could be doing this a lot more and a lot more broadly. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not a professional engineer and I'm not licensed as an engineer, so I will throw them under the bus and I will call them out. And I will basically say, as Jeff Speck does, that, you know, we, we should probably see some pretty major class action lawsuits and and uh, holding them accountable for some of the ridiculous things that they continue to build because they're not thinking beyond the automobile. And uh I, I want to go back to this particular post. This is your most recent post that you put up. This is your vacation roundup uh, from Italy and and uh, in the UK. And the reason why I want to pull this up is because we were talking about generations and thinking generationally. And so when you go to and you visit a place uh, like over in Europe where, uh, you know, buildings has have existed and cities and, and villages have existed for many, many years, many, many millennia, um, you, you start to realize, oh, yeah, this this paradigm that we have of, you know, of automobile design and the, you know, the, this impermanence sort of thing of uh, it's like, no, they're they're building stuff that's around for for generations and even longer than generations. I mean, you, you see some, you know, some just truly, truly amazing, uh, you know, sites. And, and walk us through some of, you know, you're visiting there, you've, you've got your young family, you're on vacation, and you're absorbing all of this before you, you come back to work. How special was this for you to, to experience this with the young family? It, it was pretty awesome. Um, I, I have not traveled internationally since the, the pandemic started and travel has been a, was a big theme of my life before then. It's where I draw a lot of inspiration from. And so to finally do international travel again and go to these places that are so well known for having beautiful, walkable urban town centers um, uh, caught my eye a lot. I, I didn't go to, to look at these things, but the, the eye of a, of an urban planner or a transportation engineer is is always looking when you're walking down a street or a sidewalk. And my my wife is very used to by now, you know, <laughs> yeah. not letting me pause and take my picture of the curb and getting the right angle. And uh, yeah, so yeah, so that that's, that's just normalized in my household now. My yeah, my yeah. daughter's gonna learn that too. Oh no, she'll 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 totally and, and it'll be it's it's wonderful because I'm able to appreciate. Uh, from many of my other friends uh, in this industry, uh, you know, how much the, the children, you know, pick up on. And sometimes it's, they may not be like, you know, really, really enthusiastic about it. Maybe it's just through osmo osmosis and they're just like, oh, yeah, oh, you mean like this? And it's like, oh, wow, you've been picking up on all this stuff. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Um, so, in terms of that that aspect, though, of having experienced this and then, you know, coming back to work, was it also sort of a little bit of an, an infusion of of excitement? You know, getting you know, being able to to like buckle back down to to the grind and and to the work of having just experienced, you know, these you know different streetscapes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, especially working as a consultant, the part of the big value that I bring to projects and to clients is that I am in the know with what's happening, not just in said municipality, but in other municipalities all over the place. And innovation really thrives on being able to travel, being able to blend and combine different ideas, to see a street in Italy and think, oh, cool, I, I really like the street. What do I like about it? What are some elements that I can not necessarily just copy paste back here, but adapt to, to the, the context locally. And um, an example of that, that I, I don't think I've really appreciated properly before is the, the idea of a pedestrian street or a pedestrian town center. We are, uh, we have so few of those in North America, um, but they are so common in Europe. And you, you know, you, you walk down one of these, you just had a picture up from my blog, but like a street that's 20 meters wide and the entirety of it is filled with people and they're all just walking and uh, at their own pace and, and just enjoying the day, enjoying life. I, I, I wrote a similar thought piece about um, the Rideau Canal 
a year or two ago. And, and for context, the Rideau Canal is the longest outdoor skating rink in the world. It's in Ottawa, where I currently live, and it's seven kilometers long. And I, I talked about how, um, how the Rideau Canal is actually a really unique active transportation asset because it is this very wide, very continuous thing that, that attracts millions of people in the depths of winter. And we, we don't really put all those things together to say, hey, that's, that's kind of like interesting. Why, why are people willingly going out in minus 10, minus 20 conditions to just spend time outside? There's something unique about the way this is desi- designed and functioning to, to, to make it work here. And, and it's the same thing with a pedestrian street. If you stop and observe, like what are the, the elements that are making this successful? I, I think we very much could be building more of those here in North America with the, with the right elements at play. Yeah. And I, I pulled up your Twitter page uh, because it just so happened that, uh, you know, right that there. is the image that uh, is your, your thumbnail image for, for that blog post. And uh, yeah, when you, when you, you, it's, I'm glad you mentioned that too, because so often we end up thinking about just the, you know, the, the quote unquote complete street concept of, you know, we, we have to have our, our vehicle lanes and, and we're, we've got to prioritize them. And then, uh, and then we'll, we'll do what we can to put in a protected bikeway and, and, oh yes, we can't forget about the pedestrians. And it's like, there's this sense of like, everybody's got to have their space and, and some in some cases, that is very much what needs to happen. But uh, in, in other cases, I mean, it, it might be something like this, where who do we really want to prioritize in this environment? And uh, in, in obviously, in this particular environment, uh, who is prioritized? And I believe this is in Scotland, correct? In Glasgow? Yeah, that, that one's in Glasgow. Yeah. And so, you know, clearly the the pedestrian is king in, in this particular environment. I'm not sure if it's a, a pedestrian only zone with no uh, uh, bikes allowed, but uh, yeah, it's it, it's you know, it kind of reframes things and, and it reinforces that it should be context sensitive. What is it that's most appropriate for this environment? Yeah. Yes, uh, that that's like. The one thing that's often missed in complete streets, we, a municipality will say, we have a complete streets policy. Our, 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 our policy says we will accommodate all road users on every street. Well, that's only part of a complete streets policy. You know, every, every arterial road, for example, should have accommodations for all road users. You should have an off street bike path and a nice wide sidewalk and some landscaping. But should your downtown main street have everything that every mode needs, well, you're going to run out of space very quickly if you're trying to do multiple vehicle lanes and parking and streetscaping. And so often what, what really makes me sad is that we, we provide the vehicle space first and then what's left over goes to everything else. And usually, you know, you, you have to provide sidewalks that are a certain width. You have to provide um, the vehicle lanes, but, but, there's, but nobody says you have to provide street trees. This is one of those, those things that's uh, considered a, a frill that can be uh, left aside or neglected from the design. And then you end up with this barren street that has yeah. parking and car mobility and somewhere to walk, but there's it's no complete, but no it's incomplete. It. <laughs> you know, yeah. It's like, yeah, we, we, we did all of this, but it's a complete disaster from, uh, from being a welcoming environment. So mm-hmm. I, I think to paraphrase, uh, both Jeff Speck and uh, my good friend, Victor Dover is it's, it's not complete until it's, inviting it's not complete until it's beautiful it's not complete until you know it's it's an environment where you can you know have street trees and, and protection from uh you know the the elements now, i pulled up your your twitter page here just again to um to reinforce and encourage everybody uh if you're not already following matt please do so it's at matt pender uh and then the the number one uh hopefully you can see that here on the screen we can actually zoom in a little bit here and, and so that folks can see it a little better uh talk a little bit about your approach to twitter and you're, you're quite active out there uh what are you really trying to do you know out there in in this particular Particular platform in this particular realm, because not everybody, not every professional, takes the time uh, to be active out in social media. I think first and foremost, I like to use Twitter as a platform for spreading ideas. Um, 
different people use Twitter differently in the cycling world. It's very common to use Twitter as a place to, to go rant about things. Uh, you, you see every day someone ranting about something. Um, I, I really find a lot of joy and value out of putting a, uh, a thought to Twitter or sharing a link or uh, a picture or a screenshot of a, a drawing or a photo of an intersection I visited. These are the kind of things that um, people really like to see, but I, I know that I'm interacting with a lot of other transportation professionals on Twitter and they're, they're seeing that as well. So um, it, it's really the value of being able to spread ideas quickly in, in, in tweet sized formats. So a lot more value on the picture than, than the text. Right. And uh, I, I also, of course, use it sometimes for, for advocacy. You'll find that maybe a quarter of my tweets are Ottawa or Ottawa politics related, but I try to keep most of my content to be as broad and as, as possible. And I think that the most recent thing I shared was a, a, a very technical video that talks about how we actually have a lot of wasted traffic signal time at intersections and we yeah. could be providing much more efficient intersections if we adopted something like what the Dutch do. Yeah. So yeah. that's something that I know other, other traffic engineers are seeing and hopefully clicking and watching. Yeah. Yeah. That's good stuff. And, uh, and I, and I, I'm noting that you're, you know, right about at uh, 8,400 followers. So you, you have a, a pretty extensive, uh, a group of folks that are following you, um, out on this platform. Uh, do you have any sense as to where they are at in the world? Yeah, I, I've, I have one of those subscriptions that tells you a, a bit about that. I think a, about a third or a quarter are right in Ottawa, where I live, and then another big chunk in Toronto, where I used to live and where I do a lot of my work. So I share, naturally, I share stuff from there. And then the other third is the rest of Canada and the rest of the world. So yeah. I, I am reaching a, a decently global audience with my tweets and able to, to find other people's ideas and then share them around that way as well. Yeah. I want to scroll down to the, uh, the, you know, your, your, your pinned tweet that you have here, because I think this is a pretty important one to talk a little bit more extensively about, uh, walk us through, uh, you know, what we're looking at and, and why you felt compelled to not only tweet this, but then pin it and leave it there since November. Sure. Th this is, um, First and foremost, an amazing resource that I want as many people to see as possible, but also a really proud moment for me because it was a project that I was directly involved in, hence the fact that it has stayed pinned for so long. Yeah. So uh, this is the, the, there are some pictures from the Ottawa Protected Intersection Design Guide. And when uh, when I was at a former firm uh, a couple of years ago, we got approached with the opportunity to actually to develop this for the city. The, the firm I was at, Alta Planning and Design, was really well known for pioneering the Alta or the, the protected intersection in North America. And we had already done a little bit of work for the city. And so they said, well, hey, can you, can you develop a guide that can be used by our consultants and our staff to, to really show what we need in a protected intersection in, in the city? And Ottawa had built several to varying degrees of success. The photo in the top right there is one that was built before the guide, one of, one of the city's first. And they had learned a lot of lessons along the way, and they had a lot more questions that needed to be answered. So as part of this guide, we did some field studies. We observed how people actually used the ones that were built, some uh, flaws, some accessibility challenges. We suggested ways that they could be improved. We also gave guidance for when you actually get to the detailed design process. So it's not just a pretty picture anymore, but you actually have to create some engineering drawings for someone to build it. And right. what are your key considerations there? Like making sure the, the water doesn't pool in a low area and that there's not going to be any curbs that cyclists get bumped over when they're, when they're riding. And uh, that someone who's using a cane for accessibility or for detection purposes can make sure they, they follow the correct pedestrian route. So this was a pretty awesome project. It actually just won a, a national award in Canada as the transportation planning project of the year. And so it's, it's uh, something I'm super proud to have under my belt as, a, as an engineer to have worked on. And I know since it came out, it has been um, widely praised by not just the within the city of Ottawa, but across Ontario, across Canada. And there's been interest from the U.S. and other countries as well. So it's, uh, it's really put Ottawa on the map for how they're thinking about design guidance for these. Yeah. And if you click on that link, 
it does take you to the the website there and you can you know see what what's going on in there let's zoom out just a little bit so we can see all the the language here and uh, and you can dive in and, and click through to the actual uh, intersection design guide which is right here um, congratulations I mean that's it, it, it may seem to, to many people like oh that's such boring with stuff you know you're working on a design <laughs> guide it's like explain why design guides like that are so incredibly important for the work that you're doing well, every transportation project starts out as a plan. It starts out in transportation planning where it gets scoped and some level of design is done at the 5% stage or the 10% stage. And then uh, when the project gets handed off from planning to engineering, the the engineering or the detailed design side, um, they're, they're no longer asking questions like, um, what should the layout of this intersection be? The planning study already told them what the layout is, and now they're just solving the, dis the, the details like where should the curbs go and what's the exact width of this sidewalk and what, um, you know, what specification do I provide for this type of asphalt? And they're really getting into those important details. So um, even though a 10% design may seem like something that's not that far developed, uh, it's it's where the most key decisions are made of how safe that street will ultimately be for someone who's walking or cycling. And this type of guideline is the type of guideline that planners use at that 10% stage to come up with those designs. So um, having, having this in the hands of the transportation planning staff at a municipality or at another consulting firm is incredibly powerful, especially when a guide like this has really good graphics in it. That was something that was a big focus for us because uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I've definitely been that person who flips through a guide and just focuses on the graphics without really reading the text. So having a, an easy to read intuitive guide uh, will, will have such an impact. It's already had such an impact on, on Ottawa. It's made its way in to be the official guide for how all intersections are designed. But now you know, it, uh, Ontario is looking at adopting it at the provincial level or coming up with their own adaptation of it. And uh, I'm sure other municipalities and maybe even nationally will be will be seeing something like this come out soon, too. Yeah. So it, the, the design guideline is like the conversation starter. And the further you develop it, the, the more it'll inform street design. How does it relate to, like, say, uh, any of the design guides or, or manuals uh, that have been, you know, produced by other entities, whether it be NACTO or Crow or, or somebody else? Yeah, NACTO was a guide we referred to in, in the infancy of this design guideline. NACTO has done a really good job at discussing and laying out the real principles to safe street design. So they've got a publication I really like called Don't Give Up at the Intersection right. that was uh, it's a very brief guide, but it has pages on protected intersections, how to quickly build safe intersections, different options for constraints. And that's a, that's like a really good example of a conversation starter of mm -hmm. here's an important topic, here's some stats about it, here's some ideas. But it doesn't have enough in there for a municipality to say, we, we, this is our official design guidance document. Consultants use this when you're doing intersections. There's, there's so many unanswered questions left there. Um, Crow is another really good example. Crow is very focused on principles uh, rather than you know exactly how to design an intersection. So I, I, I have a Crow manual. I took the time to read through it, and it, it really teaches you a lot about the design user as a cyclist and uh, some, some key considerations. But nowhere in Crow does it give you a diagram of a protected intersection with all of the, the X and Y dimensions, even though a protected intersection is so synonymous with, with Dutch road design. So right. um, being able to take something like that and then turn it into something concrete that a designer can just pick up and say, OK, I need to mimic these dimensions is, is really valuable. Right, right. So earlier you uh, mentioned the uh, per, the signal phasing. <laughs> so let's uh, let's pull this one up just for fun, since you uh, you, you did mention it. Um, so uh, and this was literally just a few hours ago. This is like three hours ago. What what was the issue that you felt compelled to to get this out here on? So this is produced by a, a colleague of mine who goes by the alias Ontario Traffic Man, and. He is in a very unique position in that he's a 
traffic signals engineer who worked in the city of Toronto and is now doing a master's in the Netherlands in traffic engineering. So he learned the American or the North American way, and now he is learning the Dutch way. Uh-huh. And at the same time, he has some some great video making skills that he's he's developing, and uh, he has a really gift a gift for communicating differences. And uh, he's produced quite a few good videos on how. Basically, we could be getting so much more efficiency out of our signals in Canada and the U.S., and the Dutch have gotten really good at this. We um, we seem to be much more amenable to the solution of widening an intersection before we actually try to extract more efficiency out of an intersection. And I would actually blame our, our existing design guidance as probably lacking there. I, I don't think there's a lot of innovation in, in the, the mainstream accepted practices. And, and this is one of the things that gets called out in this video is, hey, there's actually a lot of wasted time in the typical timing plan for an intersection. And look how the Dutch have solved it. And uh, yeah, that's that's the other snippet I wanted to talk to you in a, in a typical big intersection with protected left turns, which is something that is amazing for road user safety, like um, reduces vehicle vehicle collisions, reduces vehicle pedestrian collisions. Like there's there's no reason not to do it on a major street if you're talking about safety. Um, when we do these in Canada and the U.S., our design guidance ends up specifying or requiring a lot of this wasted time, and that's the the, the shot on the right there, 24.6 seconds, or rounding up to 25 seconds in a typical signal cycle that is a minute to two minutes long, that that's like at least 20% of the signal time is is red time that doesn't actually need to be there and could be given to green time or walk time for another another movement. So yeah. um, I'm very fresh off this video, watching it, feeling very, I, I was obviously very excited to share it, but it uh, it's, it's something I plan to share around in my professional circles and be like, well, you know, is there something that this video missed? Like, why why haven't we seized this big opportunity here to to operate intersections more effectively? Surely, yeah. surely someone's looking at this. <laughs> surely, you, you would think. And uh, and Jason with with not just bikes, uh, he has a brand new video that just came out. Uh, it's his longest video he's ever produced. It's like thirty minutes long, and uh, it's about pedestrian uh, safety and. Uh, and signaling and and the the way that the 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 Dutch approach the signals is is a sub theme uh, towards the end of that particular video. So it's uh, that piqued my interest that you had just tweeted about that. And I'm like, wait a minute, Jason just talked a little bit about that. So it's pretty important. It's always stuff. a good day when Not Just Bikes comes out with a new video. So I'll, I'll <laughs> set it, all it, here. <laughs> it is a very very good day and uh, and 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 big. Big, uh, huge props to, to Jason and Not Just Bikes. Um, it has uh, literally spread uh, these themes and and, uh, and other themes, uh, you know, worldwide. And uh, it, it's so wonderful to see that that channel continues to thrive, continues to grow, and uh, and more people are becoming orange pilled. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're at the point where the the term "strode" has entered the public dialogue, and you you hear it come up yes. in public meetings, and it's even making it into like official city documents. And they'll, yeah, yeah. They'll say it, a road is the common term for a, a street that is both a street and a road, and you know yeah. that's that's only thanks to the this YouTube urbanism revolution that that Jason's yeah, been. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, ter- seriously. I mean, he was he was reading Chuck Marone's work work and diving deep into the the strong towns movement and uh literally took it upon himself to 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 basically highlight some of the key tenets of the strong towns movement and including the, the you know the that terminology the strode which uh you know chuck had coined gosh over a decade ago now so uh yeah that was wonderful to to see that and it really uh, it it helped tremendously because his channel was growing at that time and it just spread it around the world. And so, yeah, it's it's great that you're also hearing from where you're at that, you know, these things are coming up, whether it's in meeting with clients or meeting in open houses and, and other types of venues. It's it's great to, 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 you know, get that feedback that that's happening. So I see on our little camera over here <laughs> that you have something pulled up. Uh, so let's let's pop on over to uh, your screen and see uh, what's going on here. Uh, and uh, oh, yeah. So so what, we um, what are we looking at here? 
So one of the things I get to do for work that I really enjoy is I run a, I, I co-run training sessions for Ontario's cycling design guidance. And that guideline I also contributed to just came out uh, last year. And it really, it really is the latest and greatest in cycling infrastructure design in Ontario. And it represents the best practice from across North America. And one of the things we get to do in this training is how we have a module on complete streets and that's actually how we kick it off. We don't kick it off with talking about the highlights of cycling design. We talk about complete streets to kind of take it big picture and then bring it in smaller. And uh, this is one of the examples we show of a, uh, a on, on paper, this is a complete street. If you look at it, <laughs> we have, we have bus lanes. Yeah. So buses have priority for, for movement. They don't get stuck in traffic. We have all the vehicle lanes that the, the transportation model specified that to, to provide acceptable conditions during rush hour. We have space allocated to bikes. Now, in, uh, in the latest standards, you'd probably, you would definitely put physical protection on that bike <laughs> lane, but the space is there. The thought was there. You yeah. have even have a nice landscaping zone. There's probably pits under these trees so they can grow big and tall. And then beyond all that, you even have like this, this paver surface pedestrian area. So complete street, right? Wow. Yeah. Problem is solved. Uh, the, the, the caveat of course, that we bring up in the training is that the complete street, like you said, needs to respond to the context. Yeah. And, um, you, you would never be able to fit all of these street elements into every corridor of, of every city. This is, this is a major highway in York region where they required a giant right-of-way because it is treated as a major mobility corridor. But this, right. this corridor is probably, um, I have to convert to, to feet in my head here, like 150 feet wide. Am I, mm -hmm. let, let's measure it, actually. I, I've got Google Maps open. It's going to show it in meters, but That's maybe okay. you can. Help we'll me we'll do the conversion in post production. There we go. <laughs> I was close. 160 feet wide. So, there you go. like, yeah. how many how many corridors in your city are that wide? You're going to have to make trade offs in the design process, and that's yeah. that's kind of how we we talk. We contrast this with like a very low key urban street that's got retail on both sides of it, and we say, well, this is also a complete street, but it looks entirely different, right. and. Uh, a complete street needs to respond to the context. Yeah. Well, and and we brought up the term strode earlier. And to me, this is still functioning as a strode. You know, it's a street road hybrid in the sense that you still have driveways here. You still have businesses that uh, uh, that are being accessed on and off. And so, you know, it, it really is still this concept of we're going to jam, you know, auto oriented infrastructure into this environment and then but it's not really going to be a highway it's not truly going to be a limited access highway there's still going to be a curb cut there's still going to be a driveway pretty much wherever you know they want it or need it in terms of the the, the side businesses not to mention the the number of, of side roads that are there and so that really brings up you know that concept of you know these are the the most dangerous you know streets that we have in our urban context and in our environment uh, because you, you have so many of these little side streets like the one that you just pulled up costa road here yeah and uh you can you can see from the tire marks here like there's a lot of people that must be taking this at speed probably big trucks sure. tend to leave bigger skid marks um all of a sudden your your beautiful pedestrian realm has to end for this and right. I, well, I, and, and I guess that's a, that's a good thing. You say has to end at this realm. Uh, they've chosen to have it end because they are prioritizing, you know, with that large radius there, they're prioritizing uh, motor vehicles to take it at speed. Um, you'll notice that they have a little bit of gratuitous uh, green paint there in the bike lane just uh, prior to the, the intersection um, saying, uh, but, oh, by the way, Good luck, <laughs> because there's going to be a fast turning vehicle uh, that, with that wide radius uh, that they're going to be able to come, you know, flying through there. Uh, also, talk a little bit about that design concept. Uh, you know, in many cities, uh, they're really using the green paint, especially dashed green paint, in the conflict zone through that intersection to highlight 
you know, to the drivers that, oh, by the way, you're crossing over a, a different realm. Uh, you know, it, if I had my wish, I would have a continuous elevated, uh, you know, sidewalk through here, you know, crossing as well. But uh, we're obviously not going to get that in this context of, of the high fast moving vehicles. But yeah, it, it, can you speak to why that green was back there instead of through the intersection? Yeah, this this is uh, I think it just speaks to the difference and differences in standards that different municipalities adopt. Yeah. This was built before the updated Ontario guidance. The updated okay. Ontario guidance does say at intersections, uh, green paint is suggested as a way to mitigate conflict, but it has its limitations. Of course, of course. Um, there's there's been studies that have shown green paint does draw drivers' attention. It encourages them to look more for cyclists, but um, it's not going to cause someone to turn at a slower speed. It's not going to offer the level of comfort or safety that's needed for a child on a bike to cycle through an intersection like this. Well, so, well and, and let's be real because you're a parent and you, you wouldn't take your child out on that, that facility. No, I would be on the sidewalk yeah. with her. Yeah. And then when we got here, it would be like full stop, how do I make myself as visible as possible? Like, and then big, run like crazy. <laughs> and then like dead eyes on all the oncoming traffic while we like slink across the intersection. <laughs> I mean, but, yeah. I mean, it's obviously it's, it's probably you know, too much to, to beat up on, on this particular municipality in this particular street. But I mean, seriously, it, it's, it's clear to me that, you know, those types of facilities were built um, sort of like how we see massive, massive surface parking lots and shopping malls with the, the, it, the you know, the busiest shopping day in, in mind is that there's going to be a parking spot for that particular day on that busiest day of the year. You know, it's you know, when we build something like this in, in, you know, through the middle of our cities, I mean, I'm looking at high rises right there. I'm looking at businesses right here. It's like, this is an auto sewer and it's a high speed hot auto sewer. And like you said, yeah, but, oh, by the way, you're, be happy pedestrians. We've got some, we've got some space for you. Be happy people on bikes. There's a little bit of real estate here for you. Now you, you wouldn't want to be there as a pedestrian, you wouldn't want to be there as a person on a bike. And hence there is no sign of a pedestrian or a bike in any of these images. Um, and because why would you, I mean, even though we did have some green space there and even though we did have some trees, um, it's still a, an entirely hostile environment. Uh, just, I can imagine what the noise level is on that environment. Yeah. You can't capture noise levels with Google Street View, but yeah, yeah. Uh, it's uh, 60 kilometers per hour. That's 40 miles an hour. Yeah, You can see the number of trucks in this picture, like yeah. one, two, three, four. All of those trucks are emitting so much noise and diesel emissions yeah. that uh, I, I, did a, I did an interesting kind of thought experiment last year, and I, I wrote an op-ed about it for our, our local newspaper where um, – actually, this would, this would help to have a map aid – Bank Street is one of Ottawa's, I would argue, Ottawa's most important north-south street. Here it mm -hmm. is running downtown, running south through some of our inner urban neighborhoods, mm -hmm. and then continuing south in, into the suburbs. And what I did is I decided to walk the entire length of Bank Street to my house, which is down here. Uh, it was about five miles. So okay. it, it, took the, it took a day because I was stopping to take pictures and... Um, chat with people and of course study curb profiles and right, right. all the other things of that course. a dirty transportation engineer does. As one would do when they're walking five miles to their house. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it was, it was a remarkable experience to go this particular transition here where the part to the north was built before the age of the car, mm -hmm. back in the area of, area of streetcar suburbs, and the part to the south was full-blown, you know, we're planning and building only for the car. And to walk this stretch and go through this such an abrupt transition. You can see here's a, a walkable main street. There's lots of cafes. There's houses that are really close to the street, to this like um, mall that's set back from the street. The road gets wider and faster. There's this awkward interchange loop thing and a big, scary underpass. 
uh, it, it like, it is such a remarkable example of a street that's, that's kind of been, has not been designed for the desired context. And it's, right. it's like a, it's disrespecting the idea of a main street that should be this place to, to exist and to walk around and instead just using it as a, as a, I think you use the term traffic sewer. Right. Yeah, exactly. And I, I mean, help me out here. It's, what can we do with these things? Cause they're, they're all over across North America. They're, uh, they're prevalent in Australia and New Zealand and many other cities around the globe. I mean, what's, what's the answer to these? How, how, how do we really effectively deal with these, you know, so that they are less hostile? I think that is the, the question of, of the day for, for my profession. And I, I do spend a lot of time thinking about this there, you know, there's, there's work around the edges kind of solutions. Like if we look at this intersection, uh, okay, this left turn could have its own signal phase and uh, this bike lane could be turned into a raised bike lane. And maybe these lanes could be narrowed up a bit and that paver strip could be turned into to landscaping. If you're redoing the street, and this street is actually being redone in a few years with very similar changes to that, um, that's a, a very like a very positive incremental approach that you can take here. But redoing the street is not going to redo the fact that this apartment building is completely ignoring the street, and there's a parking and a driveway right there, and that this this big strip mall is so set back, and people have to walk through a parking lot to to go get to the mall. Um, so there, there's like the the immediate changes that the municipality has in their control to make to a street. They can redo it. They can do safety improvements. They can raise bike lanes. But then there's the you know this, this very long term thinking of how is a corridor going to evolve over the next decade, two decades, three decades, four decades. You can put the right zoning in place, but uh, that's only half the battle because then you know, a developer still has to want to redevelop a site to, to be, uh, to turn this mall into a mixed use development. And that's all private sector investment. So um, yeah, it's something I'm really grappling with because we've built these corridors to carry high volumes of traffic and to, for them to be a street, it almost needs to be the exact opposite of that. They can't be uh, car mobility corridors. They need to be streets. Um, a lot more like exactly what this street looks like to the north of there with, with buildings that are more intimate related to the street. There's no speeding. There's no, there's a lot less noise. And that, that's like the overhaul that I think we're due for that. I, I don't, I don't think is, is happening in, in a large enough volume right now. There's, there's certainly remarkable projects that have attracted national attention because they've really pushed the limits and design guidance, but it hasn't reached the point where that is common practice to think differently about street design. And I think have, as someone who's learned a lot about Dutch street design practices, they went through that big paradigm shift in the 90s when they adopted sustainable safety and they said, we are going to design streets that are safe where, where people aren't going to get killed. And it, it really takes a fundamental shift in, in how you do driveways and access management and the built form and um, not just, you know, adding separated cycling infrastructure. It, you need to rethink the whole system. And that's why the Netherlands has built such beautiful streets is because 30 years ago now, that's, that's what they did. They rethought everything and it's led to, a lot more positive outcomes for them. So I, I think that's the kind of big shakeup that we're due for. And I, I really hope it happens in the next decade. Yeah. And their context too is, is so different now. Um, they just had a major report that came out a few months ago that, that looked at their uh, a comparison between their 50 kilometer uh, uh, streets and their 30 kilometer uh, per hour streets. And uh, they, the, the, the verdict was that those 50 kilometer per hour streets are much too fast. The injury rates, the crash rates and the fatality rates are unacceptably high. And so now they're looking at that conversion of if it's in the city center, uh, that ring road or whatever priority motor vehicle priority street that is 50 kilometers, that's going to have to come down to 30 kilometers uh, per hour. And uh, they don't have a lot of these 
uh, these strode like, you know, weird speed limit, 35 miles per hour here, 40 and, and, and all these different things. It's like, it's, it's either ultra, ultra slow, like 15 kilometers per hour, or it's the majority of the streets in the urban areas. And in the residential areas, it's 30 kilometers per hour. Again, we're talking about just about 17 miles per hour. And then you've got these 50 kilometer per hour streets. And then, of course, you have a very, very highly effective, uh, you know, actual interstate type, you know, highway system, freeway system where uh, the speeds are much, much higher. And all this being said, you know, and I bring this up in, in my interview with uh, Jason Slaughter, is that, you know, they have the highest rated driver satisfaction levels in the world in the Netherlands because their systems are designed so well and separated out from each other so well uh, that, you know, as a driver, it's it's a pleasure to drive in that country. Um, so one of the biggest challenges that I see is that it takes a tremendous amount of political will to, you know, push through and resist the firestorm of resistance to changing one of these monsters that, that we have on screen here. Talk a little bit about that, because you, you, you mentioned it earlier about, you know, getting engaged at the at the personal level, getting engaged uh, with trying to reimagine one of these, you know, massive, uh, you know, <laughs> mall type things. But it, but then also, you know, how important it is to have, uh, you know, the political will of the politicians and the leaders to be able to see through uh, a, a redesign of, you know, not only the street itself, you know, that that, you know, converting a strode to a street, um, but also, you know, the ability to you know, change the built form around it, because you've mentioned that it's in critically important that if you know, if you do the one, you got to have the other. You have to make that transformation happen to the, you know, the, the built the land use and the and the built form around that particular street. Yeah, and I I think what's so exciting about and inspiring about the Dutch example, and you you gave that really important fact that they are the happiest drivers in the world. They have uh, the highest rate of freeways per land density in all of Europe. They have auto ownership rates that are comparable to here in Canada. Like they they drive and they have amazing car infrastructure. I think I think the thing that that really needs to be communicated more is we're not giving things up or we don't need to give things up necessarily if when we want to embrace a mobility system that is safer and more inclusive for all ages and abilities. Uh, it, there, there's, there's so many people who rise to the, de to the defense of the car and say we're, we're undertaking the war on the car because you're talking about taking a lane away. Well, if we look at if we look at it from the perspective of the system we're in right now, yeah, if you have two lanes going through the traffic signal today and you want to narrow it to one, that is reduced car capacity. But what if you rethink the system and you think, well, maybe that traffic signal with the two lanes doesn't actually need to be a traffic signal. It could be a, a single lane roundabout instead and operate actually better for drivers. Uh, that, that obviously needs some more money, some more property. But if we if we can think about a corridor in that way, we can all of a sudden free up a whole lot of space that, that wasn't there before. Or just that simple example of 25 seconds of wasted time at, a, at the operation of a traffic signal. Like, why why do we accept that? It's a very technical thing. But if if people knew that, that 25 seconds or 20% of a signal's value is being wasted, then there could be a lot more pressure to just say, well, let's get more out of our signals rather than spending $3 million to widen an intersection from four lanes to six lanes. Um, so this is where I really love thinking. And, and it's not always the, the professional side of me that gets to think like this, which is why I love having a blog and doing YouTube videos, because I, I think we're, we're in need of a paradigm shift that goes more towards the, the ways of the Dutch. And right now we're kind of doing this incrementalism approach, which is getting us some places. But I think we're going to reach a, a point where um, the incrementalism can only get us so far. And if we want to go farther, we really need to shake up the system. And, and to the, the point of Bank Street that we're talking about now, I think this, this project deserves a lot of credit um, because it, it is really 
maxing out what we can do with the incrementalism approach. You know, they they didn't challenge the 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 fact that this corridor needs four lanes of car traffic, but they took all of the the leftover space after those four lanes of car traffic, and they maximized the benefit for people cycling and for people walking with uh, safe, protected intersection designs and more room for landscaping, as you can see here. So uh, the incrementalism approach is what we're kind of moving towards now, and it will get us, it will get us far. But um, I don't think when this street is rebuilt in a few years, it'll, it still won't be that street where you, know, you go and sit on a nice day and you watch the world go by. And um, I, I, I think we, we still need to work on how to get to that when we're trying to build a street. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and partly it's it's changing what it is we're measuring. So if you know when when you say that you know we're we're not able to reduce do, reduce the number of travel lanes in this corridor, that to me um, sort of strikes of a a fear that to do so would quote unquote break the street. You know, it, it's it, by reducing a travel lane. Um, and to me, that means what we're measuring is still motor vehicle through still motor vehicle throughput. We're not actually changing the, the conversation of saying, well, how many, you know, how many people does this serve? Not just throughput, but also, you know, are we able to, you know, start changing the built environment around there. Can we change the street from a place that is a flow through to a throw a, a flow to, you know, something that is a desirable place? Uh, you know, these, you know, changing the paradigm on what the street is. A, a great example is, you know, the Champs Elysees in Paris right now is going to go through a complete transformation. Right now, it's just this massive traffic sewer through you know, <laughs> the middle of Paris and, it, you know, and it's cobblestones and it, it's just, you know, it's a disaster to be on when it's full of cars, but when it's full of people, it's just, it's tremendously, you know, engaging and inspiring and wonderful to, to be on. Um, and you, you addressed yeah. it earlier. Yeah. You addressed it earlier too on the, on the pedestrianized streets that you were visiting in Italy and the UK. Um, how do we get to changing what we're measuring instead of LOS, you know, level of, you know, let's, let's make it level of satisfaction or level of happiness. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I truly don't think that is going to come from the profession because it shouldn't come from the profession. Uh, the design of streets is a reflection of our public values and our public values are determined by the public and our electorate. And, uh, the, the most transformational changes I have seen have come from when a politician says, um, we don't care about the role of cars on this street or put it, make it two lanes for cars, take away a lane in each direction and make it work. And, you know, the, a, a professional like myself could recommend that all day, but it, uh, it's not going to go anywhere. It needs yeah. a political figure to champion it and to say, um, our downtown is more of, is about more than commuting commuting drivers from suburbs. And I want you to say, we're going to assume that 10 years from now, downtown traffic will be 20% lower than today and then make it happen. And uh, all of a sudden, something that seemed unachievable before is now just the default assumption and you need to work to make it happen. Yeah. Uh, in in the all the advocacy that I've gotten involved with, it, it really just comes down to the politicians who we elect and then the senior management at municipalities that they, they put in charge and then really anything is possible. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think that's important and, you know, not every city is going to be, uh, you know, benefiting from having a strong mayor system like in Paris and New York and uh, in London uh, and I mentioned those three cities because, you know, those were three cities that I, I talked about with uh, uh, Amelia Hanna um, 
in looking at the you know this concept of of a car free megacity and really it's it's trying to break the car dependence in those three different mega cities of you know especially in New York where you know pedestrians basically outnumber the the number of vehicles 10 to 1 and yet cars still have a a, a massive uh, negative impact on the health and well-being of anybody who's a pedestrian in, you know in in the city so it, and it shouldn't be that way now you've mentioned a couple of times your your YouTube channel uh, and I want to pull up just a real quick we won't have time to, to go through the the entire video but I want you to give your your uh, sort of elevator pitch for uh this really cool video and um and really you, you and i were kicking around the idea of maybe like redesigning live now uh, an intersection we probably don't have the time to do that in in, in this particular episode but i'm going to pull this up and uh and play just a little bit of it i'll turn the volume down right now but uh i i, I can certainly turn the volume up as well but walk us through kind of what we're what we're looking at here and um and I'll try to advance it to a point where, you know, some of the work is already being done, but you can just bring us up to speed with, uh, with what we're watching. And here it is. So I, something I, I have started doing more of, or, or the purpose of my blog is really, uh, I've learned a lot as an engineering designer about how to, to change our streets. I have a lot of opinions and uh, why not start creating more understandable ways of sharing those opinions because ultimately like i said it comes down to our politicians our politicians are elected by us so with better information we can uh, elect people who will give us the streets that that are are safer and better for us so my my first youtube video and i'm hoping to do a, a series of them is me designing a protected intersection starting from a very typical suburban intersection that's very big and wide and has right turn channels and bike lanes that float on the approaches between the through and the turn lanes. And in a 15 to 20 minute video, depending on which version you watch, you'll see me transform in real time that intersection into a protected intersection and show you that it can be done without taking additional property. You actually gain some space from it. Uh, without take, without removing any vehicle lanes, so the capacity of this intersection could be entirely unchanged, but with significant changes to how pedestrians and cyclists are treated at this intersection in such a way that their their safety is prioritized and, and significantly improved. So this is the first of I love of, it. I, love it. I, I just want to inter interject there that you know that's that's really, really cool that that uh, you know, that desire and, and, and I can see that you're, you're, you're basically live, you know, going through and, and doing some measurements here and giving people some identification of that. And it seems almost like magic because what you just said is we, we're going to be able to make all of these changes and not have to take any more space. And in fact, we're going to get some space back. Yeah, this is the low hanging fruit of the, the incrementalist approach is that we, there are, uh, ways to make intersections safer today that uh, don't need a giant political shakeup in the way we design our streets. Um, they just need, when we spend our capital money, for us to do it in a way that prioritizes different road users than we're prioritizing today. Yeah. And we spend so much money every year building roads, uh, repaving roads, widening roads. Why not make sure that all that money goes to um, goes to prioritize priorities that are reflective of the future that we want. Now you mentioned capital dollars, so let's let's make the delineate. You know, uh, capital dollars where we're doing something like this, which I kind of put into the the realm of uh, of lighter, quicker, cheaper of being able to do something that doesn't necessarily require like a, a massive, massive road rebuild, like what you were talking about earlier, where maybe there was going to be you know uh, you know raised up you know, grade separated bike lanes and, and things of that nature. It could be, you know, a multi hundred million dollar, you know, street rebuild. You know, this is something, if I'm hearing you correctly, this is something that can, we can do quickly and cheaply. Is that correct? Yeah, the, the kind of design I'm showing here is the full rebuild of an intersection. That That is quite expensive. It, it can cost on the order of one to two million dollars to do something like that. But 
Um, I, I've seen countless U.S. cities. I think um, Fremont, California is an example where they make intersections safer. They build these protected intersections without touching most of the infrastructure there. They, they do it in a way that's quick build with low cost materials. And you could do it for a couple hundred thousand dollars instead of a couple million dollars. And um, with, with the right kind of will and attitudes and coordination of city departments, we, we can get a lot of this benefit for a lot less cost depending on what priorities are and if we're willing to I think a lot of the time the the engineering standards or the design criteria is seen as this like holy grail of something that cannot be challenged but if we are willing to be slightly flexible in our design criteria and our specifications then we can do things for an order of magnitude less money sometimes and you know it if we have to widen the road to provide your your 12 foot lane but we don't have to widen the road to provide your 10 foot lane well we could save so much money by doing a, a quicker build approach and accepting a smaller uh, a smaller criteria for that yeah yeah it it as i'm watching this sort of developing as in the background here as you're talking i'm i'm thinking about the resistance, the resistance to change, because some of the things that, you know, we, we sort of brushed over uh, is the fact that we took away a slip lane, you know, mm-hmm. those types of change things uh, really, you know, kick up the dander and get the, you know, get the, you know, the haters, you know, hating going this, you, know, you mentioned it earlier, this is a war on cars. Um, how does when you design something like this and you start looking at, at at this from an engineering perspective what are the other things that you're doing to make ensure that this this intersection then performs well enough that the average driver is not going to be like oh this isn't so bad you know my neighbor next door george man he was like really bragging on this and he hated the idea and he's like this is going to be a disaster what are some of the specifics that take you know make this transformation doable and and not be something where those politicians who stood their ground and and had the political will to fight for it you know they're they're not going to quote unquote lose their jobs and get voted out of office by a whole bunch of really really angry motorists because it was a disaster from their perspective so what i'm saying is is that since we're not doing a massive massive street redesign of you know completely road dieting the entire area and all that we're just kind of fixing this intersection making it incrementally a little bit safer what are some of the engineering magic that you can sprinkle over this and fairy dust or whatever that helps this intersection still perform well enough that you don't get that get complete upheaval um, from the motoring public I think part of it is is truly managing expectations. When you change anything, especially to the degree of something like this, um, it takes a while for people to adjust. Some people are going to be angry. For a period of time, there will be a higher rate of collisions because it's been documented when you change something, crash rates go up temporarily until people have gotten the hang of the new, the, the new design. So um, making sure that the city project manager who... I'm, I'm designing this project for making sure they know that, you know, from our experience elsewhere, here's some of the pushback you may get after this opens, or here's some of our documented experience so that uh, when the first complaint comes in or the first 10 complaints come in, they're not scrambling to like find money to instantly fix flaws of this intersection or um, the counselor who championed this is not getting threatened or, or, chased out of office right. there there needs to be some level of acceptance that when we change things there's going to be a period of, of flexibility where we need to, to to wait for it to settle in um but then the the other half of where we oh, i was there twice for a second yeah <laughs> that, was a <laughs> that was from the movie <laughs> <laughs> so folks yeah definitely uh, i'll i'll provide the link in the in the show notes and in the video description for uh that particular video out on your youtube channel uh, make sure that you do that uh go ahead pick it up where you, you left off yeah. there the other half is coming back to what we talked about here is like getting the most out of our traffic signals yeah. um 
a, a right turn channel is completely unhindered ability for uh, someone to turn right. So you, as soon as you take that away, someone is going to be delayed more. But can we do it in a way that, yes, they're delayed more, but they've noticed something changes at the intersection where they don't have to, you know, wait two minutes instead of waiting next to nothing. Um, you know, having a, having that kind of revisiting that lost time in a signal, seeing if we can combine different movements. So a left turn operates at the same time as a right turn or, um, yeah, th this is the kind of the innovation in traffic signal design that I'm really hoping to see more of in the, the next couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. And I agree. I, I, I think that that's one of the, the most important things is to make sure that that thought process has taken place so that, you know, when you do have some pretty major changes to that intersection, the, you know, the thought has been given to, you know, are we really truly dialed in on the on the signaling and, and these phases and all of this? Because we want to do everything that we can for this to be a, a success to the level that the next project that's being the next intersection, the next intersection, the next intersection, because we can, um, we can iterate, we can take this incremental approach and scale it up, but only if these things can start happening faster, they can't take forever. You know, the first one might take forever. The second one might take just a little bit less than forever, but you know, at yeah. some point in time, we have to have a sense of urgency and get these things ramping up much, much quicker. And, and I guess the, the third piece I want to mention there is that the importance of advocacy in making sure that these designs can be uh, everlasting. It, it's, um, it's common for advocates to criticize a new design, you know, to find the imperfections, but so much more valuable is for when a new design like that opens for an advocacy group to say, hey, this is awesome. Thank you, counselor, for championing this. Thank you, city designers, for allowing it to go through the process. Uh, you know, withhold the criticism for just a short period of time so that uh, there is some positive messaging that's going to this counselor who is feeling a little bit frantic when they get the, you know, all the, the angry emails. I, I've, I've learned through my involvement as a, you know, community advocate, the, the power of positivity when, when the city does something that you like is, is really important. And it's good for the morale of city staff, but it's also good for making sure that politicians get that positive feedback loop that when when i champion this road safety improvement people like it and yeah. it's, it's uh people are much more eager to go out to complain about something than they are to go to say thank you about something but right. the, the thank yous are really important i think there's a really wonderful point and and probably uh, something that we'll we'll wrap this up on is is just that it's you know one of the things that I keep telling folks is that you know when they say well what you know what do I need to do to be able to make these things happen in my own community and I'm like get engaged get involved you know start talking with your neighbors get your community engaged and involved and start talking with your elected officials and if it's falling on deaf ears with elect your elected officials get new elected officials bring people into power that uh, are there and then to your point it's it's like even if it's less than perfect embrace it you can give that constructive criticism, you know, later, et cetera, or, you know, even at the same time, you can, you can still say, Hey, it's not perfect, but it's better than it was. This is good. This is positive. This is a step in the right direction. Uh, because to your point, it, it not only helps, uh, you know, city staff and, you know, in, in that organization, uh, but it also gives a little bit of cover for the politicians that you know they're hearing an earful from the haters that are just like, we want to keep it status quo. We want to just keep adding more and more lanes and bigger intersections and, uh, and shove more highways through the middle of our cities. So we're doing what we can to, to, to make a difference there. I'll give you the last word. Is there any other things, any last nugget or, or, or pearl of wisdom, uh, from, from your experience that, uh, uh, folks can, can, can use, you know, whatever community that they are in around the globe, if they would like to, you know, see their streets being transformed into more people oriented places. I think I'll, I'll just leave on the note that I'm really excited about what I what I called earlier the, the YouTube urbanism revolution. It seems like every month there's someone new who's 
creating a channel and sharing their thoughts. And, you know, at, at one end, we have channels like not just bikes and City Beautiful that are really well followed, but um, the space is becoming a place where people can share their anecdotes, their ideas, their, their visions, and get a lot of following, get a lot of traction. And then politicians are watching these videos too. And general members of the public are watching these videos too and thinking, oh, okay, like this could be done differently. And we're, we're kind of reaching a state of maturity of this, this growth in social media now. And I, I think it's really making its way into these established city policies and, and documents. And I'm, I'm really excited to see what happens next. I, the, the example that's top of mind for me is Wonderland Road in London, Ontario. Jason Slaughter did a YouTube video that was focused exclusively on this project. Yeah. And, um, I can't remember like if, if one led to the other, but uh, that that project was canned because of its environmental impacts and uh, like something that was so top of mind and discussed in a YouTube video is now translating into real world action. And I think that's the first of many of, of this kind of trend that we're going to see. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you mentioned YouTube channels, of course, up in your neck of the woods. Uh, we have Oh, the Urbanity with uh, Jasmine mm. and Patrick up there. Uh, what are a couple other uh, favorite urbanism uh, YouTube channels that yet we haven't yet uh, mentioned? Uh, I really like RM Transit. He's mm-hmm. he's really carved himself out in the, the, the transit industry. And we, we chat online a fair bit. And uh, yeah, he's, he's a channel I would totally recommend checking out if, if your viewers haven't yet. Yes, yes. RM Transit. Yeah, yeah. He came up uh, as a as a recommendation from uh, Jasmine and Patrick as well. <laughs> That's great. Nice. Uh, fantastic. Well, Matt, thank you so very much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast for a second go around. <laughs> it was, it's was. it been such a pleasure. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks, John. It's been great being here. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, episode with Matt Pender. And if you have, please be sure to give it a thumbs up share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, uh, please be sure to subscribe to the channel. Uh, I'll be back next week with another episode. And uh, until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers.